Beneath a strange old oak tree, the search began. In 1795, three boys found a deep pit built a century before. They were convinced it held something of immense value. The clues uncovered were so tantalizing that men have been digging ever since. Today, two centuries later, the search continues for the buried treasure of Oak Island. Local legend says the mysterious treasure of Oak Island will be found only when seven lives have been lost. The treacherous money pit has already claimed six. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. One of the world's most elaborate treasure hunts is presently underway on Oak Island off the east coast of Canada. In the 1600s, the waters of Nova Scotia were a haven for pirates, eluding British and Spanish pursuit. Most searchers have assumed the brilliant buccaneer, Captain Kidd, chose Oak Island to conceal a priceless treasure. Others have expected to find Spanish gold plundered from Mexico and South America. Still others believe the lost crown jewels of Marie Antoinette had been buried there. As early as 1720, strange lights had been seen at night on the island's coast. Two fishermen who went out to investigate vanished. So for nearly a century after, everyone kept his distance from the uninhabited island. The mainland farmers considered it taboo. Finally, in 1795, three brave farm boys set out on an adventure which In Search Of has recreated. Daniel McGuinness, the leader, all of 18, was more fascinated than frightened by the specter of danger. He convinced his two best friends to come out and see something peculiar he'd discovered the day before. On an October morning, the island looked friendly, almost inviting. Daniel took them to a great old oak tree. Over a clear depression in the ground reached a curious bare limb, which had been sawed off a long time ago. The limb had obviously been used to hoist something very heavy. Let's dig. It must be pirate treasure. They plan to have it up and be home by lunch. But they hit flagstones set in a circular pattern made of rock not found on the island. This was the first of many puzzling barriers to their search. Ten feet down, they struck what sounded like a wooden treasure chest. But it was instead a platform of very old logs set tight into the pit, caulked with ship's putty. They also noticed pickaxe marks in the hard clay walls. Clearly, they were re-excavating a very old shaft. <laughs> they were careful to be home by dark. Days later, they got down to 20 feet 
and hit another log platform. There was no way they could have known, but this wood has since been carbon dated to 1575, the era of the Spanish conquest. Weeks later, yet another layer at 30 feet, and winter was coming. With only picks and shovels, the boys had dug as deep as they could, but they weren't ready to give up. They convinced their neighbors that what they had found could make them all rich. In the next few years, a doctor named Simeon Linz raised enough money for a major excavation. Whoa! Whoa! Back over there! Whoa! Back! Whoa! Back! Back! Gee! Every 10 feet, they struck another log platform with layers of charcoal and ship's putty, all the way down to 90 feet. If there were treasure, it was buried not only deep, but ingeniously. It was late one day when they found the strangest clue of all. sensed they were onto something important. But the letters were like none they had ever seen. Was it a sign they were close to the treasure or a warning? They worked very late that evening and finally, probing at 98 feet, heard the welcome sound of a large hollow vault. Night forced a halt. Returning at daybreak, they fully anticipated being rewarded for what had become eight years of hard labor. Their expectations were to be thwarted, however, by a diabolical trap that waited in the pit. Thirty feet down, Guinness had fallen into water. At least sixty feet of water had somehow filled the pit during the night. The treasure they had almost touched now seemed as far away as the moon. Yet a half century later, the inscription on the stone would be decoded to read, Forty feet below, two million pounds are buried. This promise of wealth inspired the next search group. When pumping failed to lower the water level, they sent down test drills. Samples from the drill indicated two large chests encased in cement. The men on the surface could hear loose metal rattling around inside the chests. And then one small fragment came up. The engineer wrote in his report, three gold links resembling an ancient watch chain. For the first time, here was evidence of fabulous wealth. In 1850, another search group noticed the water in the money pit rose and fell with the tides. Exploring at nearby Smith's Cove, they discovered stone-lined drainage channels leading toward shore. And even more bizarre, tons of coconut husk fiber, like a blanket under the entire beach. This giant man-made sponge kept ocean water flowing into the channels. But the nearest coconut tree was 2,000 miles away. Their hopes of blocking the water went out with the first tide. Frederick Blair, 
a Nova Scotia insurance salesman formed another search party in 1893. Their worst suspicions were confirmed. They found the stone channels led all the way from the beach to the money pit. No wonder they could never pump it dry. The last charge seemed to blast through into a subterranean cavity. They hoped this had finally stopped the flow of water. To check the results, they poured concentrated dye into the money pit and kept a close watch on the shoreline. The dye came up, but to their amazement, on both sides of the island. They finally realized the entire island had been engineered to continually flood the money pit. By the end of the 19th century, it's recorded that two workmen had died and the diabolically designed money pit still kept its secret. The next century would bring even more provocative clues and greater tragedy. For 300 years, Oak Island has been a focal point for greed and curiosity. Since Daniel McGuinness discovered the money pit, men have spent more than two million dollars digging for the treasure, unsuccessfully. Perhaps as intriguing as the treasure itself is the question, who took such elaborate means to conceal it? Maybe Blackbeard had Oak Island in mind when he boasted, I've buried my treasure where none but Satan and myself can find it. Before he could recover it, however, he met an untimely death. All that coconut fiber suggests South America. One theory holds that a Spanish galleon wrecked on Oak Island had to conceal a fortune in Mayan or Inca gold. Others believe the lost crown jewels of France were buried here. When Marie Antoinette was guillotined, it's known that her lady-in-waiting escaped across the Atlantic to Nova Scotia. One search party in 1909 was convinced of this theory. Among the diggers, a young lawyer on his summer vacation, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Recent scholarship, however, has proven the jewels never left France. In 1937, Gilbert Hedden, a New Jersey millionaire, came upon what appeared to be an authentic treasure map. In an obscure book called Captain Kidd and His Skeleton Island, he found a map that curiously resembled Oak Island. But more important, it included specific bearings and measurements. Amos Noss worked for Hedden that year. He recalls how they studied the kid map and searched the underbrush south of the money pit. I get it, picking the shovel, and I went down. Boy, it was hot. <laughs> Flies, mosquitoes, and things bother you. But anyhow, I uh, went around. He told me it was in 50 feet or so, where he thought it was. So I kept trying and trying, and finally I, I struck a rock. Two or three rocks. I kept trying with the pick, you know. And I tore up the sod, which was about, I don't know, probably four or five inches over the top of the stone. And I uncovered the thing. I went up one side, and I knew I had something then. I got to the point there was none any further, so I came back on the other side, and I had what he was looking for. Noss had uncovered a large triangle of stones. George Bates was on the survey crew that rushed to the island to check out this discovery. Would the stone triangle correlate with the kid map? They sighted from boreholes found in two large boulders. Then they took exact readings from the map which used the old English system of rods. 18 west and by 7 east on rock, 30 southwest, 
took them precisely to the stone triangle. Then, 14 north, tree. The triangle pointed exactly due north, towards the money pit. This seemed to confirm that uh, the kid map did mean that treasure was in the vicinity. Then, events took a bizarre turn. The book's author came forward and claimed that he had fabricated the kid map. Was he trying to conceal his sources? Or was the correlation between the map and Oak Island really an incredible coincidence? Because if that were the case, the money pit itself could be a complete hoax. Montreal journalist Darcy O'Connor is considered the leading expert on the Oak Island enigma. I have seen uh, the coconut fiber that has been brought up. I have seen reports by the Smithsonian and by uh, independent botanists stating it's definitely coconut fiber. I have seen carbon dating results that Triton has gotten showing that it's several hundred years old, that it's not glacial wood they're finding under the ground, that the metal they're finding is uh, pre-1750 and it's coming deep from under the ground. So there's no possible way it's a natural phenomenon or a hoax. Someone was there at some time, and I can only assume to bury something of great value. 92-year-old Mel Chappell bought Oak Island in 1950 because he's also convinced of the existence of a treasure. He's intrigued by what his father discovered in the money pit in 1897. Uh, well, when, <clears throat> when his chisel drill that they, they were using uh, encountered at around 153 feet, uh, what appeared to be stone or concrete for a few inches, then underneath wood, and they pulled the chisel drill up and put on an auger and bored through five inches of wood. The chips came up, and when they pulled up the auger, this little fuzzy stuff was on the screw of the auger, and uh, when they washed it out and cleaned it up and straightened it out, it turned out to be this piece of parchment. Mel Chapel preserved this fragment of parchment no larger than a dime. Clearly, there is writing on it. Such clues have sustained belief in a buried treasure. And my opinion, and his opinion, was that it is of immense value, whatever it is. In 1959, Chapel leased treasure trove rights to Robert Restall and his wife Mildred. They gave up their careers as circus daredevils to move to the island where Restall was convinced he would find the treasure and make a fortune for his family. He had no wealthy backers and no elaborate equipment. But his obsession carried him and his two boys through six years of back-breaking toil. Restall and his older son would work all day and talk about pirates all night. They became driven, mesmerized by the prospect of treasure. Mrs. Restall recalls their isolated life. Well, you had to draw your water from a pond. And of course, no electricity, no radio, no television. We had acetylene lamps. And we had a gas stove for cooking. And that's it. I think I was closer to my boys because of our isolation, then I would have been living on the mainland. It's not mother and sons. We all became friends to one another. August 17th, 1965. An old pump was draining a 27-foot shaft. No one knows for sure, but deadly carbon monoxide may have collected in the pit. Robert Restall was starting down when he suddenly became dizzy. Bobby thought his father had suffered a heart attack and rushed down to save him. Two other workmen failed to realize what was wrong and also toppled in. The autopsy report read, death by drowning. Mildred Restall now lives alone, still within sight of Oak Island. At the time I was up in the cabin, 
and I know it was after lunch and I was expecting my husband to come up any time. And um, Rick came home, came back to the cabin, passed the one that I was in and went to his own cabin, the one he shared with his brother. And I thought that was rather odd. Why would he do that? Why wouldn't he come in and tell me that my husband would be up soon or something? And I waited a few minutes and then went down and um, by, by then it was all over. And um, I, that's when I learned that my husband and son and two other men were dead. I have an idea that he thinks, at least at that time, he thought he was pretty close and what, what he thought and what it was, I don't know. He didn't tell me, I didn't ask. Three days after the Restall tragedy, a California mining conglomerate moved in. The death toll had reached six. Disregarding the local legend that one more must die, this company and its successors continue the search. After 300 years, the secret of Oak Island has eluded all the resources of modern technology. But treasure hunters persist. The present company has dug down to 230 feet and is prepared to spend three million dollars scooping out the entire end of the island if necessary. Whether it's one man with a pick and shovel or a giant corporation with dynamite and bulldozers, an unflagging obsession has drawn treasure hunters to Oak Island. Whoever conceived and executed the fiendish money pit so far has managed to outwit them all. <laughs>